This is a lecture on Realism and Impressionism, two very different movements of 19th century painting. Realism was a mainstream movement that began in England in the 1840s, and Impressionism was a radical fringe movement, at least when it started, that began in France in the 1860s. The definition of uh, English realism, which uh, is often given another title, some members of that movement called themselves pre-Raphaelites, meaning they were going back to the realism of the Van Eycks in their style of realistic painting. The definition of that movement is as follows. A movement of 19th century painting that began in England in which artists sought to create their own, quote, pure transcripts from nature, unquote. Second sentence, they did this in order to, quote, cure the ills of society, unquote. Those are quotes from their own manifesto. Uh, and that would imply, of course, they saw themselves as very important influences on English society as uh, being able to influence uh, culture and, and current events uh, in, in England at that time. The definition of Impressionism is a movement of 19th century painting that began in France in which artists conveyed their own intuitive impressions of how light affects a scene. They did this with a technique called the, quote, color patch revolution, and we'll explain how that looks when we get to Impressionist slides. And that is a quote that some in the uh, French press described as their technique. And these two movements, of course, spread well beyond their birthplaces. The English realism was adopted all over Europe and North America, and Impressionism pretty much all over the world uh, after the first few years these movements began. So let's start with a couple of the most famous English realist paintings. This first slide is called The Last of England. 1855 and the artist was Ford Maddox Brown. He was one of the most successful and influential of the English realists. He didn't officially join the subgroup of pre-Raphaelites, but his paintings were popular with large audiences, and this one in particular. Uh, the title gives us a clue, but what's happening is this is a young couple. You can see a husband and wife, and the, uh, the wife, the mother, uh, their parents, has gripping is, I should say, gripping in uh, her hand, you see in the opening of her shawl, tiny little fingers of their newborn child, their baby. So they are leaving England behind, and you can see they're physically uh, leaving England in the distance on the horizon are the white cliffs of Dover, one of the great landmarks, of course, of the English coastline. Uh, and some, some uh, historians have said, well, if, they're, if the cliffs are on that side of the boat, they can't be headed toward America. But that's rather um, arcane detail. In fact, the point of this painting that the painter himself explained was to uh, shine a light, if you will, on the courage that it took to do what these people are doing, leaving behind everyone and everything they've ever known and probably never will see again to try and start a new life in the new world. Undoubtedly, they weren't heading for vacation in France. So, um, you know, some critics aside, they're headed toward the new world, most likely the United States. It could be Canada or even perhaps um, some other British colonies, but they're headed for a new life in a new country where they'll have to start all over because they want a better life for their family and their child. And if the social ill that this painting addresses isn't obvious, um, and that would be because at the time it was painted, there was a lot of criticism in uh, English uh, chattering classes, they're called, right? Uh, the media of that time, of course, newspapers and then the live commentators from pulpits and some even professors and certainly politicians would criticize those fellow English citizens like this couple who left the British Isles f for the New World as, quote, cowards or traitors turning their backs on their mother country. And of course, this painting is trying to make the case that exactly the opposite is true. These people had to have a lot of courage, as anyone who knows if they've started over in a new country or even a new state uh, where they don't know anyone and leave behind all of their loved ones uh, knows it takes 
real courage to do that. And you see that in their faces. It's, it's a mixture of anxiety on the, the husband and wife's face and determination. Uh, and of course, the way they're gripping each other's hands uh, to you know, reinforce their determination. Uh, and then there also is a fact that I mentioned in many of my previous classes to my students that isn't well known, that during this period, this is depicting the, the early stages of a wave of humanity that literally came to our shores in a period of a hundred years between 1820, when the first records were kept by the U.S. government on legal immigration into the United States, and 1920, when there were just after that decade when uh, in the 20s a, the first racist, well, some of the first racist immigration laws were passed to clamp down on le legal immigration from em everywhere except Western Europe. During that 100 year period when those records were kept every decade, a total of nearly 100 million people came from all over the world, first from Europe and then from the Middle East, and Latin America and Asia. No other country has ever had such a phenomenon. It's unique in the history of the world. Uh, obviously, we are a nation of immigrants, and so these are representatives, this couple and the people, all the other families behind them on the deck of the boat, of uh, early stages of that wave of humanity, um, seeking a better life in the new world. And so that's the social ill that the artist was addressing, the criticism of these people, when the opposite should be the case. They should be admired for their courage. Okay, formal analysis. It's obviously balanced. They're right in the middle and, and roughly the same size. So they're two equal, nearly equal masses. Maybe she's slightly larger because you can see more of her dress. And then the umbrella would be the next largest mass. For space, every technique of English realism always did that, <coughs> uh, was used here. Overlapping, foreshortening, diminishing size, scientific perspective, there's a, <coughs> excuse me, a, a vanishing point on the horizon, and atmospheric perspective on the white cliffs and the sea in the background. Thin outline is used on all the objects. The color is mostly warm. Her shawl is a light tan color, and her dress and his coat are definitely warm earth tones as those, uh, the warm tones of their skin and all the people behind them. <coughs> Excuse me. And then we have stable. It is mostly stable. Look carefully. They are sitting straight upright. Their arms and shoulders are straight. Uh, only the outer edges of her umbrella and I guess the rope around the deck uh, are really dynamic. The rhythm is obvious with so the human bodies overlapping each other. And the simulated texture, again, on English realism, this is always a given. Super sharp and realistic. Uh, they even could have used a photo, the artist, I mean, to uh, create this composition because photographs were being used by artists by this time in some painting compositions. In any case, it has what, what today we would call photorealism on the simulated textures of their skin, the hair, their clothing, and super sharp simulated or, uh, modeling, I'm sorry, on all the objects everywhere you look. Okay. This next slide is called The Awakening Conscience. And uh, the date of this one is 1853, and the artist's name is Hunt. I believe his full name was William Hunt. This depicts a, a very different kind of social ill, uh, which is more common in upper class and upper middle class British society, especially in, in London, the capital, <coughs> at that time, and still is. It's still an, uh, a, a um, controversial phenomena we see plenty of evidence of in our current uh, culture and has, of course, been around for thousands of years. Uh, what's going on? Well, the title gives us a clue. But it's really the woman in the painting that tells the tale. Look carefully, and you see in her face a moment of clarity, a, a revelation, the word most people would use today, is an epiphany. A light has gone off in her mind, her consciousness. And she's decided, as you may be able to tell from looking at the surroundings of the room and the way the man is positioned, She's been a, quote, kept woman, unquote. That would be the phrase Victorians would have used. He's upper class, or at least upper middle class, obviously well-to-do. You can see how he's dressed. This is not her apartment. This isn't his wife. He wouldn't dress his wife in a cheap cloth dress like that. This is his mistress. He's kept her probably, um, you know, just 
in an apartment somewhere in the center of town, which would have been a common occurrence in the upper and upper middle class <coughs> uh, society of that time in England or all over really um, Europe and North America for that matter. And she's been willing to go along with it in exchange for a place to stay and food and not even a nice dress, but maybe the cat under the table might be a gift that he gave her and possibly the kid leather glove on the floor below the hem of her dress. But that's not enough for her anymore. She's looking out the window. That is a window. She's looking past us to a window. And of course, behind her is a mirror. That, that should be clear. Reflecting that open window and the light of a new day, if you want to use the metaphors that the artist probably would have implied here. Uh, she sees the light, and she will now get up and walk out and never come back. And his arm stretched out with his hand open. You can almost hear him saying, hey, what's the matter? Hey, babe, sit down. Where are you going? And she's not going to listen. She's going to leave him and never come back. And so this is uh, addressing that ill of, you know, a, a well-to-do or powerful man abusing his superiority uh, and his wealth, his higher position in, in uh, English society, to take advantage of a young and relatively inexperienced poor woman, probably was a former maid or nanny. Okay, so that's the meaning. Formal analysis, it's mostly stable. She's standing upright almost entirely. Uh, the wallpaper and, of course, the furnishings are stable. Only his body is somewhat dynamic in one or two details along the uh, the p piano and uh, mostly stable. Uh, we have her, is a, she's clearly the largest mass, then him, and then the piano. For space, we have all the techniques that English realism always used. Overlapping, foreshortening, diminishing size, and out of the window you see the atmospheric perspective across this very probably broad tree-lined street that the house is on. You see the um, hazy, misty look. And it obviously has a vanishing point, scientific perspective. Thin outline around all the objects is used. And again, like all English realism, super sharp, realistic detail on the hair, the clothing, the furniture, the skin. Same thing with the modeling everywhere. Uh, the rhythm is obvious with the arms and legs and the various um, objects, you know, and the patterns on the rug and so forth. Powerful rhythms everywhere. Uh, and it's roughly balanced, right? with her in the middle and the piano and him on either side uh, when you add the optics in the back wall it's roughly balanced and the colors are cool on her she's having a cool moment of of you know conscious or awareness and he's dressed in in cool clothes which might indicate that he thought of himself as some kind of cool operator but it isn't going to work anymore with her he, she's going to leave him okay um so that's the meaning on the formal analysis on this. This next slide is actually not on the syllabus for those of you who are students in my Santa Rosa JC uh, art history classes, but I think it's an important one to include. It was one of the most popular of all uh, English uh, realism paintings. It's called Ophelia, and some of you know that she was a tragic character from Hamlet uh, with that particular and actually most Shakespeare plays almost all had Nothing but tragic characters, but she was particularly so. We'll talk about uh, who she was in a minute. From the play Hamlet, Ophelia, O-P-H-E-L-I-A. And the artist's name was John Everett Millay, M-I-L-L-A-I-S. And the date is 1852. This is a, a scene in Hamlet near the end where uh, Ophelia, who was in love with Hamlet, uh, made known her feelings to him, hoping he would want to marry her. And he not only rejected her, he said, get thee to a nunnery, meaning not only should you not marry me, I won't marry you, but you shouldn't marry any man. And she literally went insane with uh, you know, the rejection and, and the uh, emotional pain that she felt. And so she dressed herself in a very heavy, uh, thick dress, wound around that dress were all kinds of garlands of flowers so she would weigh way too much to float and then threw herself backwards into uh, the nearby river and drowned while singing <laughs> uh, it's it's rather 
really sad scene, of course, uh, in, in uh, the play. But there's a social ill that it addresses. And there's nothing to do with Shakespeare per se, except that this scene is from one of his plays. At the time this uh, painting was done, there was a wave of romantic suicides, quote unquote. Uh, that would have been a phrase, I think, that press would have used at the time, of young, mostly young lovers who were rejected, you know, unrequited love from, you know, men and women both, where they had been influenced by either this play, for instance, the scene in, in Hamlet, or by things like The Sorrows of Young Werther, I think it's The Sufferings of Young Werther by Goethe, and other plays, songs, and novels that in the Romantic era romanticize the idea of taking your own life in response to uh, an unhappy love affair or rejection or unrequited love. So why did this artist paint it? Because he was trying to counter that. He was trying to say it isn't romantic. <clears throat> it isn't a beautiful way to die. It's sad, tragic, and even pathetic to waste your life for that. In essence, in, to put it in modern parlance, the point of this painting is saying, if you're feeling bad now because of an unhappy love affair, wait a while. Take a little time. Don't do anything drastic. You'll feel better in a little while. And it, literally, this painting was used by people in the British Isles as an illustration for lectures and church sermons and even, I think, was reprinted. In any case, it was in a number of people's homes where, you know, various social, again, commentators of that time would, uh, you know, lecture against or, or preach against the uh, waste of a young life or anyone's life being taken by suicide over a romantic disappointment, that it wasn't something to be uh, admired, just the opposite, it should be avoided. That's the social ill the artist is trying to portray here. Since it's not on the syllabus, um, I won't do the formal analysis on this one. Okay. Now, these next two slides, this one and the one right after, are my own slides. They're not part of the syllabus or about any particular work of art. This is the Musée d'Orsay, O-R-S-A-Y, in Paris, a converted from a former train station originally built uh, for the 1900 World's Fair in Paris, which was one of the biggest. That and the 1889 World's Fair that we already mentioned that created the Eiffel Tower were probably the two most influential World's Fairs in Europe at the turn of or near you know the turn the end of the 1800s end of the 19th century and the early 20th century there were world's fairs in different countries and different cities all over the world back then it was a major phenomenon oh a woman architect actually created this space french woman converting a train station into an art museum isn't an easy task but it's beautiful it's the great, world's greatest museum of Impressionism and Post-Impressionism, both painting and sculpture. You can see some of the sculpture here. Um, so, now I'll tell you something about the same. Sorry, to continue from that last slide, this is a view from the rooftop of the Musée d'Orsay, which again was a former train station actually built for a World's Fair. You can kind of see the evidence of the World's Fair and the sculpture of the different arts that were displayed at that World's Fair in 1900. Across the river, the Seine, you can see why I took this picture and wanted to go up on the roof to take it. It's uh, five stories above the entry level. Is the Louvre. You can see, if you look closely, a footbridge between the two. It's in shadow there. You can walk between these two museums, but there's no way you can see them both in one day. I think some American tourists think they can. Either one is worth well over uh, you know, a single day, but at least a whole day for each one I would recommend. <clears throat> but why I'm showing you this slide, besides showing you the close proximity <coughs> of the Louvre and the Musée d'Orsay in central Paris, is a uh, cautionary tale, a warning sign. When I wanted to get up on the roof, I saw a chain with a sign attached across the bottom of a, the five-story staircase leading to the roof. And I don't speak French, but I could understand it said passage interdite. That's a rough uh, pronunciation of a French phrase, which meant, you know, passage forbidden. I ignored it, climbed over it, walked over to the top, took this picture, and then I decided I wanted to get one that showed the river more closely. So I took a few steps forward, and I don't know if you can even see in this picture, but when I stepped uh, like a couple of feet further 
towards the railing, I heard a cracking sound. I looked down and saw that I was standing on top of a glass skylight. If I had gone any further, I would have crashed right through five floors below, and I don't think I would have walked away. So the moral of that story is when you see a sign in a foreign language that you think might mean forbidden or do not go <laughs> here, obey it. <clears throat> it's there for good reasons. Okay. Okay, this next slide uh, is by, considered by many art historians to be the first truly impressionist painting. It's my own slide from the Musée d'Orsay, uh, ergo you can see the frame around it. We'll see this view and then a, a closer uh, detail of it. Uh, this is the Pfeiffer, <coughs> and of course that's F-I-F-E-R, by Edouard Manet. And I know it's easy for uh, many people who haven't studied Impressionism to confuse Manet and Monet, but they were both Impressionists, the two leading, and some would say founding members of the Impressionist movement, but Manet was given credit by his fellow Impressionist painters. They gave him the title, the father of Impressionism, unquote. Unofficially, of course, there was no official recognition. Remember, this was a radical movement. We'll say what, how the public reacted in just a moment. <clears throat> Not very positively to the early works. So this is The Pfeiffer by Manet, M-A-N-E-T, 1866. I like to say this little boy started a revolution without even realizing it. That's just my way of saying that this painting was revolutionary. How so? Well, Impressionism at its fullest, when it's a fully Impressionist painting, and this is, if not the first, certainly one of the first, and the first famous Impressionist, fully Impressionist painting, by the father of Impressionism. When a painting is in that category, it has four of the nine elements of, of composition, what I call the rules of Renaissance realism that were used for centuries from the early 1400s until this time abandoned completely not or nearly completely not used not present four out of the nine techniques used by artists ever since the early renaissance were um, rejected or abandoned or not used by truly impressionist painters of this period of course some artists mixed more realism with their impressionism we'll talk about that later Okay, what were those four elements of realism, of Renaissance realism, that were not used here? Let's start with um, <clears throat> the uh, simulated texture. It's not sharp and realistic at all. If you look closely at his face, uh, or his jacket, uh, or his sash, certainly his upper half of his body, you don't see anything more than what it, today we call implied textures. They're not obviously super sharp and realistic. Very, very different, in other words, than English realism, or Renaissance realism, for that matter, 400 years earlier. Okay, so there is little or no simulated texture in, in a, uh, an Impressionist painting. And then there's little or no modeling. The only modeling visible is on his pants, and even that is minimal. If you look closely, the bottom half of his pants does have some modeling, <coughs> but the upper portion and everything roughly above the waist, there's only hints of uh, little bits of modeling, maybe on the flute case. But his face is pasty white. His jacket is just solid patches of color. There comes up the term I, I used in the definition at the start of this lecture. The techniques used here are color patches or patches of color. The color patch revolution, quote unquote, is what the critics of the time named it. Uh, and then there's no space. That's the most radical of all the techniques that was uh, abandoned or most radical uh, idea of this movement. To abandon in many truly impressionist paintings any sense of realistic space. Where is he? Indoors? He could be outdoors? Is he on a sidewalk? Is he in a park? Is it daytime? Is it nighttime? Is he alone? Is he in a crowd? We don't know, and the artist doesn't give us a clue, because space is not an important element, or at least a realistic depiction of space. <coughs> Certainly, the context around him is missing. He's floating, almost, and he was criticized, that is Manet, the artist, not the little boy, for having given an image that was, quote, flat as a playing card, unquote, or amateurish and childish. It was ridiculed in the press when it was uh, exhibited. 
when it first was painted in 1866. <clears throat> and then the final thing might surprise most people. Of the four elements of composition abandoned from the earlier Renaissance rules of realism in this painting and most other truly impressionists, is this. There is not a single line used in this painting as outline. Thin or bold outline around an entire object is not used here. There are alternating patches of lighter and darker and warmer and cooler colors, but there is no actual um, line anywhere. And that is another radical departure that Impressionists were experimenting with, and that's why we consider it such a um, you know, revolutionary movement. Okay, now let's take a look at a close-up of it. Okay, so here's the same painting a little closer. I think you can see the color patch effect now. His jacket is just a solid match, uh, I mean mass, I'm sorry, of patches, <laughs> um, dark blue. The same with his hat, only there the patches alternate between yellow, red, and blue. His face has almost no modeling, very, very minimal around just the very edges of the cheeks. But the rest of his face is flat as a playing card, and of course there's, there's just implied texture here. On, on his skin and on the jacket and even on the flute uh, case and sash. And once again, there's no real line here and the only technique for space is overlapping. So let's do the formal analysis here. Obviously, his hands overlap the flute, uh, his hat overlaps his head, the sash overlaps his uh, jacket and his clothes overlap his body. But that's it, there's no other technique for space no diminishing size, no foreshortening, no um, atmospheric perspective, and obviously no scientific perspective. I just said there's no line. There's minimal simulated texture. There is a little bit of modeling. As you get up closer, you see just a hint of it in the edge of the sash closest to his waist and uh, the middle portion of his pants. And uh, yet everywhere else, it's patches of color, even on the flute case, if you look carefully. That's not really strong, realistic modeling. Uh, and uh, of course I already mentioned about line. Now is it stable or dynamic? Well he's standing upright. I'd say it's mostly stable. There are hints of dynamic uh, diagonals in the flute and the flute case but mostly it's stable. There's really only three masses. Him, then the flute case, then the flute. Well you could count the sash and then the flute case. But otherwise the whole figure appears to be really basically a single mass most people would say. And of course <clears throat> It is balanced because he's standing upright in the middle and it's full of rhythm, the human figure always has, but also on the buttons and on his uh, decor, uh, the engraving, I guess it is, or embroidery rather, <laughs> on his cap. Uh, and, and then the colors, of course, are warm on his skin tones and his pants, cool on the jacket and the sash. Okay. This next slide is not on the syllabus again for those of you who are following this from uh, Santa Rosa Art History classes. <clears throat> but I show it because it's such a good example to explain, if it isn't already clear, the actual techniques used in Impressionist paintings that marked it as such a revolutionary uh, movement. So, as the French say, avant-garde, or as my aunt in Indiana would call it, avant garde uh, these are the ways that Impressionists, again, broke with the past and the techniques of Renaissance realism. So, this, the title of this, it's at the Musée d'Orsay. I took these next two slides. We'll see this in a close-up of it. Um, <clears throat> and it's called The Grand Canal Venice, 1875, by Manet. Again, that's M-A-N-E-T, the father of Impressionism. So, let's imagine you were in Venice. Uh, right now you couldn't do this, but eventually tourism will open up again. So you're, you know, it's early afternoon and you just had your Chianti and your queso, uh, your lunch, and it's hot and you just want to rest. So you find some place where you can stretch out near the Grand Canal with your feet facing the canal and maybe just use your backpack as a pillow and your hat to cover your face to shade yourself. You fall asleep. It's quite common. I've done that many times. And then when you wake up, maybe an hour or two later, you only slowly regain consciousness. So what's the first thing you'd notice? 
the dappled sunlight on the water and the reflections of the different colors on the, the, the water of the canal nearest to your feet as you look slowly further and further into the distance. The next thing you might notice is the gondola poles where the gondolas tie up and their reflections in the water because they're fairly prominent optics, right? Then you would notice the gondola itself, which of course is a large mass and it's black, you know, they're all painted dark black uh, lacquer wooden boats is what they are. And uh, that object would absorb, as black does, right, uh, the sunlight and, and the colors around it. It would dominate, in other words, your vision. So you'd notice it uh, probably next and, and concentrate on it. And as you see in this close-up, to finish up the commentary on that last slide, um, the boat dominates the center of your vision. And then you notice the buildings across the canal because of the light and shadow alternating or contrasting between the you know the shadows and the doors and windows and the you know, whitewashed or very light pastel colored stucco mostly that or stone uh, outer walls and the last thing your eyes would notice would be the gondolier because his black vest and white shirt and and black cap make him blend in with the background of the buildings behind him so this is what's meant by the artist's intuitive impressions of how light affects the scene or, and the use of a technique called the color patch revolution. Okay. And this next slide is one of the most famous paintings of the Renaissance movement by the most popular and successful, at least in his uh, early years, of all the Impressionist uh, painters during his lifetime. The most famous, most people today, if they had to name an impressive painter, would first think of Monet. We'll get to him. Uh, and toward the latter part of his career, he became even more successful and well-known uh, than the other impressionists. But in the first decade or so, the movie began in the 1860s and officially ended in the 1880s, although it continues and still is used today. Uh, this man, Renoir, is his name was the most successful of the uh, earliest Impressionists. Okay, and this one is uh, Ball at the Moulin de la Galette by Renoir. R-E-N-O-I-R. -E Ball, of course, or dance at the Moulin is a word that both means nightclub and windmill, but here it would be implying the name of a nightclub. M-O-U L-I-N, and then de la, and the last word is galette, G-A-L-L-E-T-T-E, -E. 1876. Renoir was one of those Impressionists that became very popular early on, and his work was accepted by much of the mainstream uh, art world, you know, in galleries, and, and people bought his paintings and and um, praised them even uh, in, in the print media of the day. Why? Because, well, for two reasons. One is his themes. He depicted the new leisure life of the French middle class. This was a phenomenon that even a generation earlier would not have been very prevalent in French society. Uh, by the late 1800s, especially in Paris, where he lived and worked most of his career, or in and around Paris, he... Uh, he was representative of that group. Uh, these are actually the people at the table you see in the foreground in the lower uh, right hand portion of the painting are people he knew, friends of his. And one, one of them, even the woman with the uh, dark blue dress and, and uh, bonnet on, uh, might be his fiance. She uh, used to be featured in many of his paintings and we'll see here for sure in the next Renoir painting, the next slide. Uh, in any case, these are people he would have hung out with, and they would have been enjoying the new leisure life, or the good life, quote-unquote, that was only possible because the middle class had begun to become more prevalent and got days off on weekends, either part or all of Saturday and all of Sunday, so they were able to, on weekends, enjoy relaxation and, and go to public events like we can't do now. <laughs> uh, it will again, heaven forbid, we don't ever... Uh, someday. And so this would have been a nightclub that was very popular with that new leisure class or the new rising middle class. 
uh, for you know relaxation, for you know conversation, food, drink, dance, music, and it was unique in one way. I've actually seen the building of at least the last hours in Paris. It was still there. It was an old cast iron and glass ceiling structure, and if you look carefully in the upper portion of the painting, you can see trees and hanging chandeliers. How is that possible? The chandeliers aren't hanging from the trees. That that wouldn't work. They're not hanging from uh, thin air, are they? Well, no. The explanation is, above the top portion of the painting, the ceiling of this open uh, dance hall was covered by uh, large glass panels, and those were held in place by metal framing, or beams. And from those beams, the light fixtures were hung, and then the trees were allowed to grow up in some parts of the ceiling through holes that were left there for the trees. Of course, they kept growing. So it was a unique indoor-outdoor space, is the way we put it today. And it was very popular because you could have events daytime, nighttime, of whatever the weather, cold, windy, rainy weather outside, you'd be protected uh, inside this uh, dance hall while you gather with your friends. So that's what these people are doing. Obviously, it's a dance where you see the couples in the middle and background enjoying each other's uh, you know, affections and then of course conversation happening with the friends at the table. The other reason his paintings were popular is a technique he developed that people immediately took a shine to or you could say liked uh, instantly and it's his invention or signature motif. Look at the man with the yellow chair whose arm is leaning over the chair closest to us in the lower right corner. On his back of his jacket, that's not a bunch of smudges that his four-year-old son put on his back and when he said goodbye to him in the morning before he left his house. Those are dappled sunlight, spots of sunlight. In fact, the dappled sunlight effect is what one critic, if not several at that time, described that technique, that signature motif of Renoir's as, quote, the dappled sunlight effect. You see it also on the faces and the other uh, figure's clothing, the back of that man's head, too, if you notice, in the middle of where, the back of his hair there. And on the forehead of the woman leaning over, who some think is Renoir's fiance. It's all over. It's even on the um, dance floor. And people like that technique. Now, there are some critics who uh, say that, oh, Renoir, I've seen this in somebody. Uh, he's, he's not that important an artist. Uh, his work didn't depict uh, suffering or any great social injustice or issues and all great art has to do that or it isn't really good art. Uh, I don't know who wrote that rule book <laughs> but that isn't what the most of the world thinks. I can tell you I have seen Renoir paintings including prints of course we talk about copies uh, but some of them quite nicely done life-size framed ones as well as smaller less expensive prints on walls of houses in North Africa in Israel and the Palestinian territories, in Turkey, all over Europe, Russia, Vietnam, Cuba. It's universally appealing, these images that he created. So I don't know about other critics' definitions of great art, but I would consider that qualifies Renoir's work as, as great art. It, its universal appeal has maintained itself now throughout almost 150 years on every continent practically. <clears throat> People just really like these images. Okay, formal analysis. Well, here he kept scientific perspective and atmospheric perspective. You see it in the very distance of the back wall <coughs> of this uh, nightclub dance floor. Uh, and so this has, you know, overlapping, foreshortening, diminishing size, atmospheric perspective, and of course a vanishing point for scientific perspective. So Renoir, more often than other, most other Impressionists, continued to use the rules of Renaissance realism when it came to space techniques. <clears throat> but there is no line here. None. No outline. The cemented texture is all soft and diffuse, is another way to describe it, or implied, not realistic or sharp cemented texture. Same thing with the modeling on the human figures, their faces, their clothing, and so forth. Um, and then we have, it's mostly cool, isn't it, on the clothing, and on the trees and even the hanging light fixtures, but warm on the uh, human skin tones. Um, and then we have, it's a stable dynamic. Well, look carefully, it's mostly stable. The couples are upright in the dance floor, most of them, at least that one woman is leaning over a bit uh, on the left side. 
uh, closest of the dancers to us. But the figures at the table are seated upright. The trees are pretty straight and upright. The walls in the back of the uh, dance floor of the back of the nightclub, those are stable. It's mostly stable. Of course, it's got the rhythm of the human figures. Uh, arms, hands, legs, hats, and so forth. <coughs> And I would call it roughly balanced, but there are those who think because there is a little bit of open uh, dance floor visible uh, on the left, and the group at the table seems to be one large mass. If you break it down that way, that's the largest mass. Then I guess the dancers closest to us, and then the tree in the middle, slightly to the right, perhaps was the third largest. If you look at it that way, then you'd have to say it's somewhat unbalanced uh, to the right, but I do think you could say it's balanced top to bottom roughly okay this next Renoir painting is equally famous and in some uh, uh, critics estimation or art historians uh, is probably his most iconic and perhaps best painting it certainly has all the elements of his signature motifs visible here uh, this is Luncheon of the Boating Party, and again, Renoir, R-E-N-O-I-R, -R, 1881. This is at the Phillips Gallery in Washington, D.C. You can see it there. You don't have to go to France. Uh, and it depicts people he knew. This is, again, the new or rising French middle class, friends, all people he knew, who had gone out of Paris on the Seine, that's almost certainly the river there uh, in the background is the Seine that runs through Paris, um, probably on a weekend. Looks like summer, most likely, obviously a warm season, uh, for, for an outing, an excursion into, you know, just the sort of the edges of the countryside, probably a day trip, and of course stopping to have a really great French lunch with great French wine. You can see that from the all the objects, the food and, and, and drink that's on that table. Now this one there's very little debate on the fact that the woman about to kiss the dog is almost certainly Renoir's um, fiance. Not his mistress, his fiance actually married and that's her little pet dog. And the other people would be people he knew from his circle of middle-class friends who of course supported his career and spread his, you know, the, uh, the good news about his reputation and his skills and talents helped make him popular in his early days. Now here, there is something unusual. This doesn't have scientific perspective. Look closely, and the railing doesn't line up with the uh, tent ceiling. They're in, underneath a tent, I guess, on a deck of some kind. But there is atmospheric perspective overlapping for shortening and diminishing size. So it still has most of the Renaissance techniques for realism in space. Here we have the implied or, uh, you know, again, soft and diffuse cement textures, except, you might say, on the man in the white shirt that's at the closest to us, at the lower right corner. His arm and even his face do look fairly sharp and realistic, as though he was, you know, uh, more in focus. Uh, or in our vision, he's you know more focused. And then some would say the same is true for just the hair and face of the man who's standing above that that couple in the far right. So there's some realistic cement texture, but just in a couple of details. Everywhere else you see on the rest of the people's bodies, faces, the railing, uh, and of course the bushes in the background, it's soft and diffuse, both textures, no really uh, cement textures at all except on those two details. And the same with the uh, modeling everywhere, except, again, on those two figures closest to us of the two men. Here, the largest mass, well, it's hard to say. Do you count all the people that are kind of grouped together in the uh, right-hand side of the painting as a single mass? That would be the largest mass. If not, probably the table. And then the man in the white uh, T-shirt or his uh, Renoir's uh, fiance, then the man standing behind her, and then I guess the man leaning over because you can't see all of his body, uh, <coughs> just the upper part of his what looks like a sweater. <laughs> uh, and then after that, of course, uh, it would probably be the uh, tent ceiling above them. The colors, of course, as always, are re uh, warm. I mean, on the faces and on the <coughs> Some of the flowers and the tent, again, fabric of the tent above their heads, and I guess the railing. But otherwise, it's mostly cool. 
because there's a lot of white, you know, uh, uh, blouses, jackets, t-shirts, <coughs> and the white tablecloth, and everything in the background is uh, almost all of that is cool, right? With with the uh, river and the bushes behind them. Uh, there's the rhythm of the human bodies, of course, visible throughout here, heads and uh, hands and uh, arms and so forth. And then on the table, <coughs> excuse me, the rhythm of the wine uh, glasses and bottles and, of course, some of the food, the stripes on the, on the awning. There's a lot of rhythm. And is it stable or dynamic? It's both. It's dynamic in, in the uh, angle of it, the diagonal angle of this painting. Uh, makes it feel dynamic overall, but many of the figures are seated or standing upright. And then on the table, some of the details of the food and wine, and glasses and so forth, of course, are dynamic. So it's both. And there is no line, as is true of all Impressionist paintings anywhere in this painting. Uh, and this is a classic example, again, of his signature motifs. The dappled sunlight effect is less obvious here, but you can see it on the faces of the two men <coughs> in the background talking at the far corner of the deck on his hat and on the uh, upper uh, or I should say right side of the other face of the man wearing a cap and a little bit on the hat or, or bonnet of the woman leaning on the rail you see it on the left side of her cap so because they're under an awning there's limited amounts but still a few areas where you see his most famous signature motif the dappled sunlight effect This painting is by Pissarro, P-I-S-S-A-R-O, and the title is Boulevard Houseman, that's H-A-U-S-S-M-A-N-N, 1898. Pissarro was one of the first Impressionists, one of the first painters to join the Impressionist movement, and he was friends with uh, pretty much all the other Impressionists especially Manet and Monet, and maintained his friendships with them throughout their lives. Uh, but he also was one of the uh, Impressionists that never really abandoned this style. In fact, this painting, the d date of it, the late date of 1898, uh, is an uh, indication of that fact. Uh, the other Impressionists, most of the other Impressionists, had abandoned the style except for Renoir and Monet. Uh, most of the others moved on to other styles, or they might occasionally go back and forth between post-Impressionist styles uh, of their own making, which is a different topic for another lecture, uh, and maybe occasional Impressionist paintings even after the movement disbanded, but officially it disbanded in 1886. This is, what, 12 years later. So here we have a view, some historians believe it must have been from Pissarro's studio, or the balcony in his apartment, in Paris. Clearly it's a view of a street in Paris that has the same name now that it then was recently named for. The man who was, some consider the first modern era or modern day city planner or master planner. He was hired by Louis Napoleon, Napoleon III, the emperor of France who was the nephew of <coughs> Napoleon Bonaparte who had a master or enacted a master plan and hired Hausman to do the design for most of or well, many of the main districts of the uh, city of Paris and uh, the city was a medieval city of course well actually it goes back to Roman times but the buildings are mostly medieval era and they were knocked down many of them thousands of them <coughs> and replaced with the buildings you see in Paris today which are mid to late 19th century and in wide boulevards tree-lined boulevards with uh, new street lighting. In fact, if you look carefully, the closest street light indicates an electric light. Now, this is long after Edison invented the electric light bulb. So by that time, Paris had become what it is today is nicknamed the City of Light, uh, largely because of Edison's electric uh, light bulbs. Uh, but the point is the design of these wide boulevards that are so elegant with buildings with the same cornice line, or the same height, I should say, of cornice line, all the way down miles of streets, and big open uh, uh, plazas, fountains, traffic circles, uh, and parks, 
uh, throughout the city, and of course monuments, in some of these open plazas had, about the history of various parts of uh, French history, uh, the figures of French history, I should say, who were uh, commemorated with statues. Throughout the city of Paris, you see these today. And so the whole, almost, not all, but almost the whole city uh, was redesigned in the decades between, oh, about 1850 and 1910. And Haussmann was the main, the supervising landscape architect uh, or city planner for that project. So the street was named after him. And it's clearly, this is an Impressionist painting with all the elements of Impressionist painting. So let's take a look at this. It has, this one though does have realism in space techniques. He, that is, Pissarro did continue, much as Renoir did, to use throughout most of his Impressionist paintings. Uh, the Renaissance rules of realism when it came to distance. You absolutely can see the atmospheric perspective in the the distance. There is a vanishing point, the far end of the boulevard, overlapping, foreshortening, and diminishing size. But the simulated textures, there aren't any. They're implied, but it's all diffused and soft, as is the case with the modeling on all the objects, the people, the carriages, the buildings. Um, and then this has a rather warm tone overall because this would be early evening in judging by the trees and the vegetation there and the clothing on the people probably early November or sometime in the early fall early to mid fall I should say uh, just as the evening lights are coming on and the street lights along the boulevard it's a wonderful evocation of that time of day in this beautiful part of well, many of us would agree the most beautiful city on earth, Paris. Um, and then you have, of course, uh, the rhythm of the trees and the windows and chimneys on the buildings, the people, the carriages. Uh, it is mostly stable. Look carefully because the buildings are lined up straight, the trees are straight, the carriages and the people are standing up uh, straight. Uh, and there's the rhythm, of course, right, of each of those objects that we just mentioned, repeated street lights and even kiosks on the street uh, sidewalks. Uh, and then there is no line, as there is never in any true and precious painting. And finally, it's roughly balanced, but some would think uh, it may look to many like it's unbalanced toward the right, because you see more of the buildings on the right. But if you draw the line down the middle and count the street as mass, uh, right around where the uh, closest light or lamp post is, I think you'd have to say it's roughly balanced. Uh, and clouds have mass. If you count them as having mass, it's also balanced top to bottom. Otherwise, you might uh, say want to say it's uh, unbalanced toward the bottom. Okay. This uh, next painting is the dance class by Degas, D-E-G-A-S. 1874. Degas is one of those painters who trans, transited <laughs> or was able to, <clears throat> you know, work in different elements of both Impressionism and Realism into the same painting or paintings. He did that almost throughout his entire career. He definitely exhibited with the Impressionists many years during their, oh, 15 years or so exhibiting together. Uh, but not every year, and sometimes he would, uh, you know, have a beef with some aspect of the Impressionist movement or one of their exhibits and uh, refuse to uh, participate. But the main point is he used elements of both Impressionism and Realism in the same paintings and clearly shows in this painting. You have the two little spoiled <laughs> darlings, uh, the girls on the farthest uh, left side of the painting. Their upper bodies are clearly realistic. Their hair and uh, their skin and their blouses uh, and even their faces look fairly realistic not super sharp like uh, English realism but they're definitely not impressionistic however their tutus are impressionistic and then the legs of the girl with the green sash closest to us they're realistic again and then as you look down the row of ballerinas or, or students dance students uh, further uh, along the wall uh, you see all their tutus and in most cases, their upper bodies in the middle and far grounds are 
impressionistic, but the instructor is fairly realistic. His clothing, his hair, he's an actual person who was a famous former dancer and instructor for well-to-do families who could afford to send their girls to lessons in his dance classes. Uh, and then we see the floor. The floor has actual line. You can see that where the floorboards are. So that's more realistic than impressionistic, though the texture isn't strong there. So it's a it's sort of a hybrid. But the walls are impressionistic. The marble columns, the mirror, the ceiling are not sharp and realistic. Cemented texture or the modeling. So it's it's a blend. But his signature motifs, he had three. With first, the what I just mentioned is that he would almost always mix areas of realism and impressionism in the same painting. Second, were uh, his uh, topics, his themes, were almost always performing artists, singers, musicians, dancers, and even uh, racehorse jockeys. And then the third signature motif may be the most distinctive, and it shows up very powerfully here, and that's the use of an oblique angle or sharp diagonal. Almost all of his paintings, except portraits and close-up views, uh, still lives and things, had that aspect. You see it here as though you're wandering, let's say, down a hallway looking for someone in one of these classrooms, and you don't know which one it is. So you open doors and look in at an angle, and you know, impromptu or informally, you just peer into the room for a moment. It captures that feeling brilliantly. It draws us into it much more than a straight head-on view, the traditional realistic style paintings that have been used for centuries. Now, he got that idea from Japanese prints and paintings that had been using it for centuries, which he had studied. He was also good friends with Mary Kasada, our next artist we'll be talking about soon. And they supported each other's careers throughout their uh, professional lives. Uh, uh, he supported her work and, and invited her to join the Impressionists in France, and then she promoted his work, and they even traveled together in the United States, where his work wasn't as well known. Formal analysis, I've already covered the uh, simulated textures and, and the modeling. Uh, here we do have a little bit of line, like I said, around the outer edges of the uh, two upper bodies of the closest uh, girl that is facing us, that are, whose backs are to us, I should say. Uh, and then, of course, around the instructor's clothing and the floorboards. Otherwise, there isn't any line anywhere else. This has scientific perspective, clearly, overlapping, foreshortening, and diminishing size. It doesn't have atmospheric perspective, of course, because it's an interior view. Uh, then there's the rhythm, obvious, powerful rhythm of the dancers, the tutus, uh, the decorative uh, columns along the wall, the floorboards. It is mostly stable. The only thing's dynamic are the tutus. Just about everything else is upright. And it's roughly balanced, although you could make the case, I guess, more unbalanced than balanced to left to right, and, and of course towards the left because of the two closest dancers with their backs to us. But the floorboards have mass, so if you count that, it's roughly balanced. But in terms of human figures, it's unbalanced toward the left, and yet top to bottom, I think you'd have to say it is balanced because the figures are mostly human figures across the middle. And then the colors are cool, I would say, on the floor, certainly on the instructor's clothing and the tutus and the walls, mostly cool, but warm on the um, uh, skin tones and hair of the girls and the, uh, da the, all the dancers except the... Okay, this uh, next painting by Degas also right, is uh, The Glass of Absinthe, A-B-S-I-N-T-H-E, 1875. Absinthe, some of you may know, is a very powerful, very potent drink. I think it's supposedly 20% or more alcohol, it, it used to be, and it had wormwood in it, which is a uh, very uh, strong almost poisonous, uh, toxic substance that can induce hallucinations in large quantities. And the color of the liqueur, it's a liqueur, is green. So it was nicknamed the Green Goblin. You can see the green color in the glass or, uh, in front of the woman in the middle of this painting. But it um, was something used by a lot of artists. Uh, and Van Gogh drank it so much that some people think he was hallucinating under the influence of it when he created some of his most famous paintings. Uh, there's some evidence for that, but no, no proof of it. But we know he drank it a lot and liked it. He mentioned it in his letters to his brother, Theo. Uh, 
Um, but when you used it in large quantities as just an average, you know, citizen of Paris like this would be a cafe scene in Paris, uh, it usually was a way of trying to escape or forget the troubles of your daily life. And that's clearly the case with this couple. Now, there are two theories. One is that Degas saw a couple just like this, maybe sketched them and went home and painted them. And, of course, he's depicting a dysfunctional relationship. We'll, we'll say what the clues are in just a minute, if it's not obvious already on first glance. And then the other theory is that he uh, wanted to create a scene like this, so he hired two models to pose like this. But it just has too much of the air of an informal, uh, spontaneous moment captured by an observant artist. Uh, for me, I believe it, it really was a scene he saw between two real people in a cafe. Take a look at their body language. Her slumped shoulders, her head tilted forward, her disillusioned, a dejected, even depressed look on her face, and the fact that she's almost clearly drained the bottle on the table next to her, or between the two of them they have, but it looks more like he's got a beer in front of his uh, arm there. If she drank that much absinthe, she'd definitely be in a near um, stupor. <laughs> and, of course, it, like you said, in high, large quantities, it, it can cause hallucinations. So she's what some people would call self-medicating, assuming that this is a real couple. Why? Because of the guy she's with. Look at him. He can tell he's not paying attention to her. He couldn't care less about how she's feeling. He's probably eyeing some young woman coming in the door or, you know, sitting at another table in this cafe. Uh, this is not a happy couple. <laughs> and dysfunctional would be putting it politely as to what kind of relationship they have. But uh, as uh, some psychologists have pointed out, sometimes you can be more alone in a relationship than, than uh, without one. It's obviously not a healthy relationship for her, and she probably should leave, but she doesn't have the strength. Uh, at least that's the implication of this scene. And it's got all the hallmarks of uh, Degas. There is um, a mixture of realism and impressionism. The realism is mostly visible on her face, and uh, it's a somewhat a little less so, but still fairly realistic and not impressionistic on his face. And on the beer in front of him and the bottle next to her that seems to be empty, although the glass appears to be somewhat impressionistic. Everything else around them and the rest of their bodies are impressionistic. It has that oblique angle, obviously, extreme diagonal uh, angle that we see here to draw us into this scene. Now, this is an exception to his other signature motif. This, these are not performing artists. <laughs> Uh, this would be a depiction of an average, maybe working class or lower middle class, probably working class couple in a working class neighborhood bar, probably, or bistro, as it would be called in Paris. So the formal analysis I already mentioned about these, I mean, it takes the same as two of the modeling. It's mostly soft and diffused, except on her face and his, and perhaps on the, uh, the beer, it looks like a glass of beer and the empty bottle next to her. Everything else is... Uh, impressionistic, not realistic modeling or strong modeling or similar textures. There, there is some line around her shoulders, of course, uh, and around the edges of the tables. So that is a difference from, and of course, that's what he was known for, mixing some realistic techniques with impressionism. And then we have for space, we have diminishing size, foreshortening, and overlapping. And that's about it. There are, of course, no scientific perspective or atmospheric perspective. It's cool, mostly cool in the colors, including the green uh, drink in front of her, which, by the way, um, absinthe has a licorice-like flavor, and it is available again today. It was outlawed for decades after the turn of the century in both Europe and the United States because it caused so much uh, harm because of the potency of it. But it is legal, has been for a while again today. But I don't think it's as potent as it was in the late 19th century. The largest mass, well, it's hard to say. The wall behind them, probably. Uh, and then uh, her, because you see more of her, I think. And then him. And then, I guess, uh, the table with the bottle. Um, it's mostly stable. They're sitting upright. The wall behind them is upright. But it's got some diagonal, I mean, some, some dynamic lines to the diagonal angle of the tabletops, of course, so there's some of both, but more stable than dynamic. And it's roughly balanced left to right. Um, okay.
This painting is by Mary Cassatt, that's C-A-S-S-A-T-T, -T, A Cup of Tea, 1880. Mary Cassatt was the first famous American woman painter, and there really isn't any debate over that at all. Uh, women just weren't uh, given much uh, of a chance. In fact, painting was not an easy profession for American painters in America, male or female, in the late 18th century. So many of them moved to Paris, which was already the art capital of the world at that time. Remained so for generations. Some say New York or London is today, but in any case, it was Paris then. So she moved to Paris from Pennsylvania, I believe it was Philadelphia, where she was living, uh, after learning how to paint in the United States, and she met early after her f arrival there, uh, Degas. I believe he saw her sketching uh, a, an old master of some kind painting in um, the Louvre. In any case, they became friends, lifelong friends, and he supported her work and even uh, recommended her to be a member, become a member, join the Impressionists, and she was accepted immediately because of the talent she clearly had. So some of her techniques or signature motifs uh, are similar to Degas, but there's no way to know for sure if she was, you know, directly influenced by him or would have thought of these on her own. The oblique angle is the most obvious in this painting. This is a friend of hers, married to a French citizen, so she would now be legally a citizen of France, an expat, <coughs> and you can tell she's married someone well off. She's dressed quite finely. And she's got very, uh, looks like gold-rimmed teacup and uh, silver service. So uh, clearly not someone from the lower middle classes or working classes. Uh, these are the kinds of paintings that uh, Cassatt would paint. Portraits of women and children, and often women with their children. In other words, families at home in their domestic setting. In other words, domestic and family life. Now, that's one of her signature motifs no one else was doing. The course painters painted portraits of their own family or commissioned portraits of individual um, clients' families, but not their entire career focusing on families, especially mothers and children. That wasn't considered important, but I don't think anything could be more important. We wouldn't all be here if it wasn't for that. And on this Mother's Day, I'm recording this. It's especially appropriate to say that she not only felt that powerful you know, connection with mothers and families, but she had a personal uh, interest in it because she could not have children. No one knows exactly why. It could have been a medical reason, a birth defect. Whatever the reason, we'll never know unless some new letters crop up, but she was never able to have her own family and never married. So some uh, psycho-historians, that's an actual profession, psycho-historians might say that she was sublimating her, uh, you know, dis appointment in not having children by painting other people's children and families. In any case, she's got the oblique angle here that Degas had been using, which she could easily have picked up from him or from just studying Japanese prints on her own. And the mixture of realism and impressionism. Now that she probably was influenced by Degas because the uh, glove and the teacup and service in the center of the painting are very clearly realistic. Everything else around the rest of the woman's attire and all the objects around her are impressionistic. And then the fourth signature motif, so she had more than most artists, that distinguishes her work from other impressionists is the use of geometric patterns, strong, powerful patterns of repeated shapes or rhythms in the objects uh, surrounding the main subjects, especially noticeable here on the chair, but also in the flower box behind her. So we have the soft, diffused, uh, modeling, we have no realistic cement texture anywhere except on, as I said, the, the, the gloved ar arm and the teacup and, and spoon. Everything else soft and diffused or no real cement textures. Uh, this is dynamic uh, because of the oblique angle and the woman sitting uh, back as well as, of course, her arm and then the flowers in the flower box. Uh, we have overlapping foreshortening and diminishing size for space techniques. Uh, then we have cool colors and everything around the woman and obviously warm on everything uh, of her dress, her bonnet, her face, but cool again on the teacup and the glove.
Um, and then there's only actually very little line, if any, maybe just around the glove. I, I don't even see perhaps the top of the teacup, but everything else, there's no line. And she's the largest mass, then the chair, and then the flower box. And it is roughly balanced. Uh, well, it's carefully balanced, I should say, roughly, because uh, you see the rhythm of the arm uh, of the chair and the flower box. That creates balance, as well as her being placed across the middle. Um, and then, let's see, I think we've got, uh, you know, rhythm. Oh, it's stable and dynamic. Yeah, uh, I think we covered that. All right. Next, we see another, even more famous painting by Mary Cassatt. This is Cassatt's most famous painting. I, I grew up with it. I would look at it every time my parents took me to the Art Institute of Chicago, which is a quick side note. If you haven't been to Chicago and you ever get there and you have more than a few hours layover or whatever time to go downtown, go to the Art Institute of Chicago if you haven't already been there, because uh, it has the best collection of both Impressionist and Post-Impressionist paintings outside of France, certainly in this country. Uh, most of my French friends will, would, would agree with that, uh, because uh, people in Chicago collected the early Impressionist and Post-Impressionist before most American cities, uh, well-to-do art collectors, were doing that. So the beneficiary uh, is the public that can go see them at the Art Institute of Chicago where this painting resides. It's her most famous painting. It's The Bath. I already spelled Cassatt. C-A-S-S-A-T-T. -S -S and the date is 1891. Although some place, uh, sources place it as late as 1893. She at least had done a version of it in 1891. So that's the date that uh, uh, we use here. Well, here's what we were talking about just in the last slide. This is one of her signature motifs. A mother and child right at home and a moment of tender uh you know loving care between the mother and her young three maybe four year old daughter and by the way baz back then you were talking about even with solid middle class or upper middle class families with rare exceptions they wouldn't have had indoor um, showers yet or even sometimes bathtubs so often children at least were, were bathed in, in little basins of water like this so that's what the mother's doing you see how close they are, how loving, and, and how attentive the mother is. Uh, this is what she focused, like I said in the last slide, Cassatt focused her entire career on this theme, this, these types of scenes. And so it's probably a friend of hers and that friend's daughter. And then we have the oblique angle that just jumps out at you in this one. And then, of course, you have the geometric patterns repeated. If you look carefully, it's there everywhere. They're on the wallpaper, on the dresser painted patterns on the dresser and on the um, the rug underneath them or carpet as well as on the mother's dress uh, but of course that that wouldn't be unusual but everything else around them is much more individually uh, her signature one of her signature motifs and then we have the realism and impressionism mixed it, it's very clear the two human figures are realistic uh, as is the picture but the basin, at least the water in it, and everything around them is impressionistic. So for formal analysis, it's beautifully balanced with them across the middle. The largest mass, that's easy. The mother, then the daughter, and then probably the dresser behind them. Uh, and then the basin. Here there is line around the two human figures. Strong, uh, and some would even say bold outline, but no line in the background. For space, we have overlapping, foreshortening, and diminishing size on the rug. And we have strong realistic modeling on the two human figures, especially on the skin, but even somewhat on that uh, picture, and uh, at least the outer sides or edges of the, of the basin. Everything else, there isn't any. It's soft and diffused around the rest of the room. The same is true for the textures, strong simulated textures on the two human figures in the picture and implied textures everywhere else. It's mostly stable, but it feels dynamic because of the uh, diagonal lines. The two of them do form slight diagonals. Uh, the room around them, it depends on how you look at it. The wall, paper, and the dresser behind them, you'd have to say is stable. But the diagonal line the rug is, is, is viewed at here would make that seem dynamic. So it's a mixture. 
Um, and yeah, and then of course there's the rhythm of the human body, the arms, hands, legs, and then the patterns of the objects around them, and of course the mother's dress. This painting is by Monet, it's the other founder of Impressionism, often uh, mentioned in tandem with Monet. Monet, M-O-N-E-T, and it's Rouen Cathedral, the Porto. Rouen, a city in a beautiful city in northern France, very ancient, historic city, R-O-U-E-N. Rouen Cathedral, the Portal, 1894. So, Monet is one of the first two Impressionists. We've mentioned that before, along with Manet. They knew each other, respected each other. Monet became much more successful. Manet, only briefly near the end of his life, well, not briefly, but the last few years, was able to get some public recognition. He was respected by other artists, as we know. Monet struggled for many years, surprisingly. He, he was, again, respected by other Impressionists, and by some critics, but his work wasn't considered appropriate by the mainstream press and uh, art world. In the early years, the entire precious movement was rejected, as I mentioned, as a radical fringe movement. But as it grew in popularity and his work matured, uh, and he lived to be well into his 80s, uh, and continued Impressionism, he never abandoned it, uh, it became more and more popular and successful and eventually uh, fairly well off. Uh, we'll talk about that aspect a little later. But this is an example of one of his main techniques in his Impressionist paintings, both rural and urban scenes. This is an well, urban, you know, it's a fairly good-sized town north of Paris, Rouen. Uh, and it's the medieval or Gothic cathedral in that town. And he would take the same object, same scene, even exact same perspective or composition of that scene and paint it dozens of times, anywhere from, well, a dozen to two dozen times, at different times of the day and in different uh, seasons. Why? Because he was trying to capture the effects of light and how it changes from one time of day to another or one season to another. So there's a subtitle that some historians have given this painting, Rouen Cathedral, uh, Morning Light Summer Effect, because he painted this in the morning and in the summer. He kept notes, not all, all of his paintings, but on some of them so we can know when he, you know, when, what time of day, what season he painted them. So here we have a classic example of Impressionism but with one extra added element that isn't as clear in the other impressive paintings we've been looking at before this. Look in the area of the soft modeling, shadowy, uh, recessed archways of the three doors, the triportals that all Gothic cathedrals have, and then up above where there's a bit of a flagpole, it looks like, projecting outward. Uh, that would be the rose window. Um, there are a dozen different colors, or close to that, multiple colors, interspersed in the areas that would normally be uh, just considered shadow, you know, dark colors like dark brown or gray and, and maybe a little, uh, you know, light, almost black uh, touch. He noticed that in the shadows you can see multiple colors, reds, greens, blues, purples, uh, oranges, grays, uh, just all kinds of other shades. And he captured that brilliantly in this particular painting and many of his other paintings, uh, especially ones where there are shadows on the surfaces of buildings. Okay, so you see here that this has the soft, diffused modeling of all Impressionist paintings. There's no simulated texture at all, it's implied. There's no line. For space, all we have is foreshortening, and some would say there's a hint of overlapping with what looks like the flagpole across the rose window in the middle of the facade. If you count that, then yes, that's one small, tiny hint of overlapping, but really the only main technique here for space is foreshortening. Uh, you can't even say diminishing size because you only see one of the towers clearly, and even it's not completely depicted on the left.
And then we have color. Well, I just mentioned a mixture of all kinds of colors, though at first glance you'd have to say it's a soft, overall warm kind of stone-like color, uh, not the cool gray stone that some cathedrals were, were made of because he's capturing the soft summer light and the presence of many other colors in the shadows here. And then the sky is mostly cool, but even it has a few warm colors, tiny bits of them interspersed if you look carefully. But that's mostly cool. The rest of it is almost entirely, uh, well, mostly warm with little hints of uh, bluish gray here and there in the shadows. The rhythm is obvious with the pointed arches and uh, what there is of the decorative detail you just see hinted at across the facade uh, and the three doors. Uh, those details, the windows, the pointed arches, of course, that all Gothic cathedrals uh, have in their doors and windows are dynamic, but otherwise it's mostly stable. It is roughly balanced left to right, uh, and if you don't count the sky as having any mass, then I guess it's slightly unbalanced toward the bottom since the sky, the little bit of sky that is visible is, of course, therefore, uh, would be lacking in mass. It's a single mass. I don't think you can break it down into smaller and larger masses, and there's no line of any kind. Um, and, of course, we, we already mentioned the rhythm, and then uh, we have... Uh, the use of warm and cool colors throughout the entire painting. And Monet experimented with that more than any other painter of the Impressionist movement. So let's see how he did that with a, uh, a rural scene. This is a classic example of Monet's uh, latter period of painting in which he was painting his own, the grounds, I should say, of his own estate. And we'll say how did that happen in just a minute. Monet, again the artist, Japanese Footbridge and Water Garden, 1899. So you see by the late date, he's, uh, as I said uh, with the last slide, one of those artists that never abandoned Impressionism, kept using that technique and that style all the way through his uh, professional career. Uh, and he was, when he painted this, he was the uh, recipient of a French government gift, which is typically French, <laughs> that they thought to do this. He had become one of their most famous and influential artists by 1890 or so. I think that was the year he got gifted a repossessed, government repossessed estate of 20 acres with a chateau in Giverny, a, a small area, I think that's the name of the nearest town, G-I-V-E-R-N-Y, I believe it's spelled, I've never been there, it's, I think south of Paris, in any case it's that, to be not suburban Paris, it's out in the countryside of uh, central France basically, and he was given that after the uh, government had seized it for non-payment of taxes from someone else, as a gift by the French government, therefore the French people, to one of their most famous artists. And that's really a strong statement of how much they value their artists there. Can't imagine that ever happening here. <clears throat> so he would be able to live, in other words, the rest of his life, which he lived well into the late 19-teens, I believe, till 1917, uh, without having to worry about paying rent. I mean, he had to pay taxes, I think, once a year. But uh, mortgage and rent, he didn't have to worry about. So he was free to paint as he chose, and he could remodel or re landscape, I guess is a better word, the grounds to his taste. So he had this bridge designed as a Japanese style bridge and much of the landscaping was his as in this uh, lily pad. He's famous more for that than anything else. His paintings of lilies, he did hundreds of them in his uh, latter years while he lived in this estate at Givendi, which is by the way open to the public now as a museum. <laughs> the grounds and the chateau. So what do we see here? We see a balanced composition, beautifully, uh, you know, sh uh, showing that effect of a bridge across the middle, exactly balanced, of course, with the uh, water lilies in the pond, of course, below it, and then the trees and bushes above it, or all around it. So all the elements balance, not just the bridge itself, but the placement of the objects. And then we have some hint of cemented texture here. That is unusual, but it's, again, implied. You see where it looks uh, different uh, below where the bridge would be? That's where water lilies wouldn't grow because this, the shadows from you know the bridge on the water. And so there it almost looks like a clear reflection of just the waters 
surface of the uh, pond without the flowers growing on top of it as you see on either side of that strip of clear water so that has some cement texture you'd have to say but everyone else it's everywhere else is, is implied soft and diffused modeling everywhere and of course it is a mixture of dynamic and stable but mostly stable the trees like the weeping willow and the, the um, actual railings of the bridge are stable but the arc of the bridge is dynamic and then the water is mostly stable there's not much dynamic except for the individual blossoms of the water lilies uh, and then we have the warm colors of the water lilies and the sun where it hits the trees but then the trees themselves the bushes and certainly the bridge and uh, most of the water lily pads are cool so it's more cool than, than uh, warm there's no line here none as outlined this has scientific perspective atmospheric perspective overlapping foreshortening and diminishing space as we know uh, was one of the things about Monet he tended to continue although in some of his paintings he did abandon realistic uh, techniques for space but most of the time he kept doing those the way Renoir did and Pissarro uh, and then we have the largest mass well it's a close call probably the uh, pond if it you count it as one mass then maybe the bridge or the weeping willow uh, and then we have um, soft, a little bit of hints of modeling under the bridge arch. I didn't mention that before, but everywhere else the modeling is completely diffused. Um, and then, of course, the rhythm of the water lilies, the trees, the bushes, and the railings on the Japanese footbridge. This is one of his most famous paintings, but it's similar to many, many others. Uh, that he did throughout the latter 25 or so years of his career. Now we get to the last artist of this lecture. We'll have a couple slides of his work because even though he's not a painter and you might think what's he doing in a lecture on Impressionist painting, there is some kind of connection in that A, he was working at the same time, he was friends with most of the well-known Impressionists, and his sculpture tended to have an impressionistic quality not super sharp realistic detailing the way almost every sculptor had done in, with their work all the way back to the early renaissance so he was breaking some of the rules of renaissance realism at the same time and he respected and admired the impressionist paintings and vice for painters and vice versa they respected him this is rodin r-o-d-i-n the thinker 1889 or as my aunt in Indiana used to pronounce his name, first name, uh, August, Augusti Rodden. This man is often considered, I think inaccurately so, as the greatest sculptor since Bernini. Some say period, but certainly between the Baroque era of Bernini, early 16, the mid 1600s, and the late 19th century and early 20th, uh, Rodin's period of uh, career was from the late 1800s to the early 1900s so he was active for about 50 years he was certainly the most famous sculptor in the world during his lifetime there's no debating that why because he developed su several new signature motifs or techniques the first one I'll mention is his quote is this is his own phrase now malleable lumps of clay unquote that he used to create these figures of course he start out as clay models and then they get cast in bronze so this figure you see I took this slide here it's at the or in the grounds in front of the uh, Rodin Museum which is another example of the French government uh, supporting their artists in this case they gave Rodin when he had already become you know, world famous, the, their greatest sculptor, a four acre estate with a chateau on it as a home without having to pay rent or mortgage, just the annual taxes. Again, uh, probably a tax repo type of situation, in fact, I'm sure it was. It's now the Rodin Museum open to the public with most of his famous sculptures, uh, original sculptures, uh, visible inside and outside the chateau. This is outside, obviously, and you see the French word, the thinker, on the um, more recently placed uh, pedestal but he's sitting on you see the mile of a lump of clay I, I don't know if i need to explain that but you see his leg there that's not normal 
either he was in a severe accident, right, from the knee on down, his leg is permanently injured, or it's just actually not that at all, of course. It's, it's Rodin's way of depicting uh, less strictly realistic detail. The same is true of the hair, right? You see that? It isn't detailed and refined like human uh, European, I should say, sorry, European hair. Uh, hairdo hairstyle would be it's it's just you know plastered on his on his top of his head as is true of many of the other figures sculpted by uh, Rodin he didn't care to do finished detail in every part of his figures though some aspects here of the hips and uh, the shoulders realistic but then the arm has some of that malleable lump of clay quality to it that's one signature motif, how he depicted certain aspects of the human figure with clay. The second one is the base. Every one of his sculptures has a base with a rough finish. You see the rough finish on the base. And that's symbolic of his statement that we're all made of clay. We come from the earth to which we shall return when we die. Not a pleasant thought, perhaps, but an absolutely undebatable fact of life. So it's it's a a hint of or an indication of human mortality every one of his sculptures he did that at least his famous ones uh, and then then you have the fact that he tried to portray the inner thoughts and feelings of his figures through his poses more so than almost any sculptor had done at least since Bernini because Bernini did do some of that as well but his figures are more classical or uh, historically oriented uh, there's no reference to any, you know, um, mythology or uh, gods or, or historical figure here. Some of Rodin's figures were, but even the ones that were modeled after real people were mostly contemporary French artists and writers that the French government wanted to honor, or he did, uh, portraits of them. <clears throat> but this, there's no person, individual person, from real life that he's trying to convey an image of here. It's just a universal symbol for the fact that we often have to sit, or humans often do, sit and ponder the meanings of life and death and uh, the universe and our place in it. Uh, the Thinker, the title tells us that. Uh, it's someone lost deep in contemplation. Uh, but it also is a good example of how uh, when he created these figures, they became so famous and so popular. This is reproduced all over the world. And if you haven't been to the uh, Legion of Honor Museum in San Francisco, when it opens up again, stop in the courtyard if you haven't already uh, been there and look at the exact life-size replica of this, which is an original Radon. What does that mean? It means it was authorized by him from the mold, from the original piece, and then cast by his studio and signed by him and shipped to San Francisco. It had to wait till after World War I to be put in place. Uh, so imagine it sat in a w warehouse until the war was over because it was placed in front of that museum in like 1921 or so. But it's an authentic, that's a definition of an authentic original Rodin. This is the original original. Other copies are all over the world. This is such a famous image. Finally, why did he sculpt it? Because it was meant to be uh, commissioned as one of several figures which indicated various aspects of human existence and the you know struggles we have with different aspects of uh, relationships, uh, sin and temptation and you know uh, introspection and contemplation that were going to be placed on a large metal uh, gateway that never got constructed. Life-size figures attached to that. And the nickname for at least some people gave that project was the Gates of Hell. <laughs> don't know if it was meant to be <laughs> the entrance to a cemetery. I doubt it. I think it was supposed to be some private development that never got built. So he kept the figures. And that's why they were, uh, the originals are almost all at for that unbuilt gateway. Like this figure and the next one you're going to see at the Rodin Museum. Okay, balance, yes, it's a human figure. There are two masses, him, then the base. Uh, the only technique for space is overlapping, but it, it, it's real space, real life-size human figure. Uh, and then we have, of course, it's dynamic because of the pose. He said it, there's not hardly any straight lines. Here, there's a texture that's realistic on parts of his body and uh, more rough and unfinished looking on other parts. But there is, of course, the real texture of the smooth bronze.
it's a smooth I mean sorry a cool color as bronze usually well it can be warm in this case it's definitely a cool greenish gray there's no technique for modeling just the shadows from the Sun there is carved line of course there had to be to make it on his face and, and parts of his body here uh, that was the original clay model so line here is carved <coughs> and um, let's see uh, balance mass color line rhythm texture I think we get oh yeah it's well I already said it's dynamic yeah. um, and the human figure of course has the repeated shapes of the uh, hands arms feet toes eyes ears and so forth okay this uh, next to last slide here two more is Rodin's The Kiss 1898 this is marble he worked in marble too like any really good uh, successful popular sculptor he would have to have mastered both mediums uh, and so this is inside, in, in essence, the back area of what I would have to call the main hallway or, or living room, which probably was used as some kind of a dining or living room space when he lived there, um, of the Rodin Museum. He placed it here so that the modeling of the light, the natural light from the window that, of course, it's coming from the left side. This is my own photo of this. Uh, <clears throat> inside this uh, first floor of the Rodin Museum, uh, that that is natural modeling. It's it's He chose the, the space, or not the space, the placing, I'm sorry, of these uh, figures or of this sculpture uh, with that uh, natural lighting in mind. So what does it depict? Well, it's it's so obvious and it isn't the obvious part is it's a couple embracing and passionate a kiss in a passionate kiss and of course there's a hint of something odd about it we'll get to it in a minute about the man but let's talk about the inspiration for it there were two inspirations for why Rodin created besides it being commissioned as one of the pieces a bronze version of it if it had ever been built for that gates of hell or gate that was never built that I referred to in the last slide but this particular version of it, which he capped his whole life, um, it depicts two things. One is a scene from Dante's Inferno, the famous uh, medieval poem about hell. Two adulterous lovers, Paolo and Francesco, Francesca, sorry, and Paolo, uh, who are married to other people but in love with each other, uh, indulge or start to indulge their passion and then shortly after that they die or are taken away to the next level and end up in a lower rung of hell because they're adulterous lovers so there is that reference to a famous work of literature as an inspiration but the other is his own life he had pursued for over a year a young protege assistant some would say student of his who was like 21 and he was in his 50s at the time who worked for him along with dozens of other people uh, he was so famous and his commissions were so numerous that he had to have a lot of assistance she was the most talented perhaps of that uh, particular period of in his studio and also quite beautiful quite intelligent um, and he wanted to have an affair with her he was living with a common law wife they weren't legally married who he, he had been supported by in his early years so he's dependent on her for many things financially and otherwise so he wasn't going to leave her and she resisted him for over a year. Her name was Camille Claudel, who some of you know became a very um, successful sculptor uh, in her own right after their relationship. But they ended up, she finally gave in to his attentions. 15 year long affair, obviously adulterous affair. <coughs> and finally he broke it off, I guess, when his uh, common law wife perhaps objected finally enough times or otherwise he just decided he needed to move on. She never really got over it, according to all the evidence. Uh, she she never found another relationship and she depicted aspects of the relationship in her sculpture for decades afterwards. She lived into the 1940s, uh, by the way. So this depicts somewhat his own mea culpa, you could say, in that he's admitting he was engaged knowingly in an adulterous relationship but look at the thumb on the man's hand as he placed it on the woman's hip his thumb is raised now that clearly indicates the intention of Rodin to say oh well all right I know I was having an adulterous improper affair committing a sin as the phrase would have certainly been then 
But at least I was reluctant about it. That's pretty much what it says in a nutshell, to use modern terminology. He was trying to say that he, you know, recognized at the time that it was wrong, as if that was any way of excusing his having pursued someone who resisted him for over a year, and obviously he had the superior power and influence uh, in that relationship. So that's an interesting biographical detail <clears throat> that is often missed by other art historians, but well documented. Okay, uh, formal analysis, balanced, of course. They have to be. Uh, there's your rough base, by the way, and very realistic in this case, everywhere. The cement texture on the skin, the hair, in this case, is not that malleable lumps of clay. Of course, it's not a clay model. It's uh, carved with carved line, of course. On, and then there's a real smooth texture of the marble, of course. It's a cool white color. Uh, he's the largest mass. Uh, then the base, well, it's a close call. Maybe then her, I guess, and then the base. Uh, and then we have uh, modeling already mentioned, natural lighting from the sun. Uh, it is stable on their upper bodies and dynamic on their lower bodies, and I guess the base. For space, it's, it's overlapping. It's the only technique here. The two life-size human figures that overlap each other. <clears throat> and the rhythm is obvious with the arms, hands, uh, feet, and heads. This last slide we're going to look at is not on the syllabus, but I think it's a, a nice counterpoint to the last thing we looked at, the, uh, the kiss, which, as I mentioned, was somewhat autobiographical and a kind of a mea culpa or, you know, minimal admission of uh, perhaps responsibility by, by Rodin. This is in the Rodin Museum. It depicts, it's a miniature, by the way, of, uh, carved, of course, marble. It should be obvious it's marble. It's in a display case. I took this photo. And it depicts the more honest um, version of what happened in the relationship where he pursued her and she was reluctant. It's called Eternal Idol. So he still had feelings for her in 1905 or circa 1905. They had broken up in the 1880s or early 90s, long before so he still thought about her, of course. Um, and this depicts a young woman, obviously, you know, meant to depict um, a nude image of Camille Claudel and him, also in the nude. And he's clearly the aggressor here. He's being much more uh, forthright about the nature of their relationship in this piece, many years after the kiss. Um, and I'll end, end this lecture with an interesting little anecdote that only can happen when you're in Paris and you happen by chance to meet another art uh, fan or lover of some um, renown. Kevin McCarthy, no, Andrew, <laughs> I said Kevin, that was his father. Andrew McCarthy, who starred in, uh, let's see, the Joy Luck Club, and um, St. Elmo's Fire, very famous actor from the 80s and 90s. He hasn't done much lately. But this was in uh, the early 90s, so he was still quite active. He was actually filming a movie in uh, Europe. And he was traveling incognito, or he thought he was, with several days' growth of beard and dark sunglasses and kind of, you know, covered up with it. It was winter, so he had heavy coats and clothing on whenever I saw him. I saw him three times in three different museum settings in Paris. Uh, in tow with him was his Italian model girlfriend, and uh, she also, I believe, was acting. I don't know if it was in his film. But anyway, I first saw them outside it, it, waiting in the line to get into the Musée d'Orsay. It was all on the same visit within a few days. Next time I saw him in the Louvre, entering the Louvre through the glass pyramids, and disappearing on probably into the hallway where the Mona Lisa is. The third time I saw him was coming out of the Rodin Museum, which is when I took these slides. And so I stopped him finally. I decided I had to say something. I said, excuse me, aren't you Andrew McCarthy? And he goes, yes, I know. Uh, yes, you got me. I'm the actor. And he said, so what do you want me to, to, to write? Uh, he thought I wanted his autograph. No, I wasn't interested in that. I said, no, no, I'm not asking you for your autograph. I'm an art history uh, professor from uh, a college in uh, the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area. And I'm just wondering, because I've seen you now uh, at three different museums, and I'm curious, if you don't mind my asking, which of those three museums did you like best? My assumption was he'd say the Louvre, or maybe the Musée d'Orsay. But he didn't hesitate. He said, oh, that's easy. This museum, the Rodin Museum. And I said, oh, well, that's surprising. 
can you tell me why you found this museum to be the most interesting? He said, oh, I can tell you easily. Upstairs, that little miniature, the eternal idol, this this uh, figurine, it's actually, these are just a few inches tall, these two figures. Uh, you saw it? I said, yeah, actually, uh, I think I noticed you leaving the room when I was there. He goes, yeah, well, I stood and looked at it, me and my girlfriend, for a long time. And I said, well, what was it about it that captured your, your interest or made you like it so much? He said, well, until I saw that piece of sculpture, I never dreamed that stone could be so erotic. I thought that was well put. So I asked him, do I have your permission to quote you? And he said, yes. So just keep your eyes and ears open when you travel and you're in an art setting, whether it be a museum or outdoor art, sculpture, architecture site. Uh, you never know who you might meet and be able to share your love of art with. Okay, end of the lecture.